All right. First lesion would be ascarid larval migration. This is a picture taken a long time ago. I've got a lot of pictures with this guy's hairy hand in it without gloves. I don't know who he was. Maybe he died at age 40. I'm not sure. But So here we're looking at, at ascarid larval migration. And they're like every other ascarid life cycle. I'll assume you know it. With liver spots, which microscopically, basically you develop these lesions 10 to 14 days after the larvae start migrating because these lesions are developed because of an inflammatory reaction, an allergic reaction to them, all right? In the, in the liver, you're looking at an eosinophilic interstitial hepatitis or a portal hepatitis, depending on the terminology you want to use, with a lot of eosinophils there. And then following that, there'll be fibrosis. So what we're looking at here are locally extensive areas of inter- lobular fibrosis that form these milk spots. In a very acute phase, there'll be some hemorrhage involved, and I think you can appreciate that in a few of these places, they're kind of a pink color. Microscopically, there'd be hemorrhage also associated with the inflammatory reaction. And then in the lung, there's diffuse interstitial pneumonia. The lungs fail to collapse, and a kind of a characteristic feature of these, there'll often be edema, but there's, there's diffuse petechia of the lung diffuse petechiation that's involved in with this interstitial pneumonia. And generally, if you're taking boards, when, when you're supposed to see the lung lesion is when you have just exactly what you have here. You have a liver and a lung in the same slide, and you obviously have ascarid larval migration lesions in the liver. You're supposed to look at the lung, okay, and see whether you've got the lesions in the lung. Now, in this case, you also have lesions of bronchopneumonia in the lung. So you've got three different at least three different morphologics or gross diagnoses you should have on that. Okay, this also is a lung with ascarid larval migration. Again, we have diffuse edema, we have hemorrhage, inter interstitial pneumonia, and there's here it looks like there's a great big area of, of bolus emphysema here, which is very unusual for pig. Okay, we've already described that liver lesion. Milk spots, typically. Um, and if I were going to use a gross diagnosis of milk spots for boards, I'd put it in parentheses, personally. I would, although it's correct, I'd use a little bit more scientific gross diagnosis, probably put milk spots in parentheses. Okay, this is the crummy of crummy slides of mine. Haven't ever gotten it replaced, but these lesions are essentially the same. These are, these are larval migrans of Stephanurus dentatus, or the kidney worm. In this case, the migration in this, if you look it up, goes from intestine through the peritoneum to the liver and then to the connective tissue adjacent to the renal pelvis of each, of each kidney. It's where the adults insist, and they drop their eggs into the ureters. Okay, same lesion, just much more severe. In cross-section, that's what it looks like. Tremendous portal fibrosis with hemorrhage. Microscopically, same lesion. Very, very severe eosinophilic portal hepatitis, right? Okay, let's talk about toxic hepatopathies in pigs. Xanthium or, or Cockleburg toxicosis. Um, when, when xanthium or Cockleburg toxicosis occurs, it's rarely seen anymore because it's only the very small dicotyledon stage of Cockleburgs that are toxic and we have very few animals that are pastured with high amounts of cockleburs on pastures or on pastures in general. So you rarely see this lesion, okay? And Gossipol toxicosis. Gossipol is a, is a toxin that's found in decor decorticated cottonseed meal. Cottonseed meal is very rarely fed to pigs. A, it's too expensive. B, the dairy industry uses about all of it that's available, corn soy rations in this country, and occasionally with some other uh, sources of protein are used, but very seldom cottonseed meal. So, but it's something that if you see these lesions, you want to keep in mind because you could have a ration mixing error. The other issue with this is this has to be fed for extended periods of time to have lesions develop, usually greater than one month. And if there's been a feed mixing error, that feed's usually long gone before you have lesions in pigs. Hepatosis dietetic, dietetic or vitamin selenium deficiency, coal tar toxicity, clay pigeons. 
typically are, are what have been described. A lot of the clay pigeons made today are made out of uh, plastics. They aren't made out of coal tar. So just because they're shooting clay pigeons over pastures, you really have to find out what brand they are and analyze them to know whether they're toxic. Aflatoxicosis and fumonis and toxicosis, in both cases mycotoxins. I'd like to think of these kind of in groups, of three groups of two. Let's look at the first two. Okay, here we're talking about uh, lesions that are acute, that tend to be very regular in their patterns in the lung. They're lobular. They're very regular. They tend to be centralobular. And if they become panlobular, they're diffusely panlobular. The lesions, I don't think you can tell apart. The next two, hepidosis dietetic and coal tar, they tend to be massive hepatic necrosis, but they'll have an irregular pattern. You have complete lobular necrosis followed by lobules that are partially necrosed, surrounded by other lobules that are unaffected. But grossly, you'd probably diagnose it as massive hepatic necrosis. And then the last two, aflatoxicosis and fumonisin toxicosis, they're, they're totally dose dependent on how they appear. But in general, the doses that we see where they are uh, intoxicating, they tend to be levels that have to be fed for extended periods of time in order to create the lesion. So they tend to be centralobular, and, and we'll look at some of these. They tend to be centralobular, and by the time pigs are showing clinical signs from being fed these agents, you'll actually have hepatic atrophy and fibrosis being a component. But they tend to be chronic toxicity. Okay, this is a liver with uh, cocklebur intoxication. Here we're seeing a very obviously accentuated lobular pattern in this liver. We're dealing with central lobular hemorrhage and necrosis, and then a very yellowed appearance in the periportal areas, and that's because there's, there's vacuolar degeneration of those hepatocytes with fatty chains. That's why you get this pattern. This is a cross-section of this liver. I think given this pattern, you know you have a very diffuse change. It's very acute. I think you can see that. Cockleburr, Gossipol, if you had very, very high levels of aflatoxin, it would be appropriate also for this lesion. Okay, and microscopically, that's what that looks like. This, actually, this is from a different liver. It's the closest thing I could get. This liver also has, these are too wide for a pig. Those are eosinophils. That's actually got two lesions in it, a toxic hepatopathy in addition to interstitial hepatitis or periportal hepatitis, or portal hepatitis, I'm sorry. Okay, this is, this is hepatosis dietetica, or vitamin E selenium intoxication. Now here, this is what I was talking about. You've got some areas of this liver that look normal. You've got er other areas where there's massive necrosis, and you can see entire lobules affected. Okay, hepatosis dietetica or coal tar intoxication, I think would both be appropriate for this. This is a cross-section of another liver with vitamin E selenium deficiency or hepatosis dietetica. And then this is the only section of liver. This is from a feeding study done at Iowa State with aflatoxin. This liver was small and there was fibrosis. I look at this liver, I can't tell there's fibrosis grossly, but I know that it's light tan in color. That's about all I can see given this. Microscopically, there was uh, accentuated fibrosis in this liver. Okay, microscopically, if you read the literature and you, you get a, a slide of liver from a pig and you start seeing this sort of thing where you've lost You've lost some of the pattern. I think you can see here, we have a, a rim of cells right here where there's vacuolar degeneration. Okay, and they're going in kind of a circular pattern, suggesting you may be looking at the periphery of a lobule. And then we have here, this area where we have accentuation, uh, individualized hepatocytes, pycnotic nuclei, hypereosinophilic cytoplasm, degeneration and necrosis of hepatocytes. That's generally the type of lesion that's described with both aflatoxicosis and chronic feeding studies with fumonisin in livers of pigs. The difference is with aflatoxicosis, oh, I'm sorry, and in both cases, because these are chronic conditions, as you have hepatocyte degeneration like this, you'll also have hepatocyte hyperplasia going on. So you'll have some megalocytosis in the liver also. You have large nuclei, large hepatocytes. It's because it's chronic. You've got cell death. You've got cell division. You find some mitotic figures in this liver. With aflatoxicosis, you also get uh, bile duct hyperplasia, 
You'll get bile duct hyperplasia, and you'll get bile ductule hyperplasia. Those, those little oat cells that, that proliferate just outside of the hepatic plate. See that with aflatoxin, but that's not been described with humanosin. So that's a differentiating feature for those lesions. Okay, this is a liver. This is another one of those livers with miliary or multifocal necrosis in it with septicemic salmonella. Differential for this would be pseudorabies. If you've got a scale in it, you can see whether it's a really little liver or a really big liver. That's how you make your differentiation because pseudorabies causes necrosis in livers in only very young pigs, generally. And salmonella, generally, affects grower-finisher pigs. Okay? Again, there's a more acute paratypoid nodule. In this case, we just have a focal area of hepatic uh, necrosis where you've almost got liquefactive necrosis here. You've got fallout without inflammatory cell infiltration yet. And this is one of those really teeny pig livers I was just talking about with miliary necrosis. This is pseudorabies. So look at the scale when you see miliary necrosis in a liver. If you're asked to write a differential for this lesion, a differential would be microabscessation. And that's described in pigs caused by, by uh, beta hemolytic streptococci. You can see it with Streptococcus equisimilis in pigs. You can see it with, and this is really a far out one, but you can see it with listeriosis. Remember listeria? It's, it's fairly rare. In fact, it's very rare in pigs. But when it occurs, it occurs in very young animals as just a fulminant septicemia. In the case of listeriosis, when it looks like this, they're actually just bacterial colonies you're looking at, grossly. That's how many bacteria are in them. Okay. This is, a, this is a focal area of necrosis in a liver from a pig with pseudorabies, a little higher magnification in this necrotic area. I think you can see this nucleus, this nucleus, this nucleus. Here's a really good inclusion here. Okay, It's unusual to catch a pig liver in a place that you can see that nice inclusions with pseudorabies. Okay, And you can also have the same lesion in pigs in the spleen. I had the, had the slide, so I showed it. Okay, and in pigs also, as a hereditary condition, they can have multiple biliary cysts. If it's hereditary, typically the same pig will have multiple renal cysts. Okay, and I think it'll probably be color covered under the renal talk. The appropriate way to deal with this, pigs commonly have renal cysts, but they aren't necessarily a hereditary condition. If you don't have a liver on the slide, you ought to call those multiple renal cysts. But if you have both a liver and a kidney on the slide and you can see that both of them have lots of cysts, it is probably a hereditary condition, then it's appropriate to call those polycystic kidneys because that implies a hereditary condition. Okay, next carousel. Okay, we're going to start at the nose, and we're going to end up under the tail. Starting in the mouth of a pig, pig have uh, small carnasal teeth, needle teeth they're called. They're typically or milk teeth. They're trimmed at one day of age in most operations to keep the pigs from excoriating the face of other pigs as they nurse. Sometimes when they're trimmed, if it's not done carefully, they will they'll cut the gum here, and you'll end up with a with an erosion or ulcer and then other infections. So if you're look that's what caused this. If you're looking to hang a gross diagnosis on it, it would be something like focal ulcerative and necrotic uh, chelitis, stomatitis. Okay, this is also, there's tooth. You could call that a lot of weird things, couldn't you, if you didn't get looking at the slide just right, but that's a mouth. And we're looking at a young pig in a, that has been eating a ration that uh, uh, contains the mycotoxin uh, T2 or a trichophacine mycotoxin, causes epithelial necrosis. Most of the trichothacines are feed refusal factors, and in most cases, animals won't eat enough of it to cause this lesion. Okay, so theoretically, if you gavage them, 
you can get this lesion throughout the GI tract, but in general you won't because they won't eat it. Okay, so here we have a uh, ulcerative and necrotic stomatitis gingivitis. Right, smiling pig. We have ulcerative glossitis in this pig. Um, what do you do with this? You hang a gross on it. The reason I put it in here, I wanted to talk about a condition. This has been, this has been in the literature for about the last 10 to 15 years, and, and there was just recently a paper again by Dr. Kelly Lager from National Animal Disease Center. I don't know what to make of it, but the reason I bring this up is because there are several papers over the years on it, and that is that there are, con there are situations in large swine herds where there'll be a condition where pigs have ulcerative glossitis, and these are generally young pigs, suckling pigs to early nursery, and they'll also have lesions around the coronary band, followed by an explosive outbreak of exudative epidermitis. And there have been ba various papers that have tried to associate an isolate of porcine parvovirus with those lesions, predisposing to ex exudative epidermitis. Um, Dr. Kratzy from National Veterinary Services Laboratory isolated that virus many years ago. They recently tried to fulfill Koch's postulates with it at National Animal Disease Center and could not reproduce any lesions. So I don't know. Um, I just don't know. But I think you, if you run on one paper, depending on which paper you run on to, if you're not aware of all the literature, each paper sounds rather convincing. Either way. Okay, here we have a normal, again, take a look at the scale here. This is esophagus all the way to the stomach, and we're probably looking at a total length of slightly over 10 centimeters. These are young, little pigs. Normal esophagus. Here's an esophagus with this yellow granular material, material over it. This is candidiasis, esophageal candidiasis. You want to hang a gross lesion on it if you've seen these things. Now, let me go two more. This is what it looks like when you do scrapings. Almost that entire mat that you're looking at is a mat composed of yeast forms and pseudohyphae from candida. There's really very little inflammation in it. You can see also bacterial overgrowth in this scraping. So knowing that, if you're going to hang a gross diagnosis on it, um, maybe pseudomembranous esoph esophagitis or might be, or, or a yeast pseudomembranous esophagitis is more accurate than, a, than the obvious, which is fibronecrotic, based on the color. Okay, I think either one would probably be acceptable. The first is more accurate. This is the same lesion in the stomach. We have a pseudomembranous gastritis. This usually occurs, as in every other mammalian species, when you've had large amounts of antibiotics given to animals. It's not a, it's not a common lesion, but we see it periodically. You can also see the lesion in the duodenum and in the small intestine, but it's most common in the oral cavity, esophagus, and stomach. All right, I think that's the same pair of hairy hands we saw earlier. And here we're looking at anemia and maybe some icterus. This is a large problem in the swine industry today. We're dealing with gastric ulcers. Okay, I think the, the preferred, the preferred in, in the Carolinas, where this is a tremendous problem, they call these animals bleach outs for obvious reason. That's the colloquial name for them. These pigs get weak and they turn white and they die. It's the largest cause of death in grower finisher animals in the Carolinas now, right? Here we're looking at a blood clot in the stomach. We have colon laying beside it to show that we have digested blood in the colon in this animal. It is an ulcer of the pars esophagia where there's stratified squamous epithelium. The preferred name for this condition now is ulceration of the pars esophagia in pigs, not just gastric ulcer. That's to make a distinction between peptic or pyloric ulcers that are more common in people. It's a different lesion in a different place, and they're drawing that distinction. Okay, picture the same thing. Okay, and this is what we're looking at. You can see how abrupt the change is. This is where stratified squamous epithelium should have been. Generally, they'll erode down until they get to a decent-sized artery, and then those pigs will bleed out gastrointestinally something that one has to be careful of when you're looking at slides, and I'll show you a case of that in a minute. Sometimes they'll intermittently bleed. They'll become very anemic, but they'll have no blood in the upper GI tract at all. But because blood, because passage in the large intestine is slower than the small intestine, you'll have digested blood in the large intestine. 
can be mistaken and often is by practitioners for hemorrhagic colitis. And it's just melina or digested blood that's retained in the colon. You see that color, you want to go back and look at the stomach. This is a very uncommon lesion. This is probably from reflux from the same thing. Here we have an ulcer that's perforated in the distal esophagus. So we've got an esophageal perforation associated with, a, with an ulcer. Um, there's recently been some work done in North Carolina trying to, to determine the cause. They've looked at risk factors, and this is done in the Carolinas in warm temperatures. They found that it's most common in viros, neutered males. It's genotype specific. Some genotypes of animals are much more susceptible to these than others. Down there, it is a very big problem in their hottest weather, in, in the real hot summer. It's associated, and this is the one we've known a long time, with very fine grind of feed, and, and that would include pelleting. Pelleting is the fineness of grind, and it, the pellets break down the minute they get to the stomach anyway. Probably one of the biggest factors is it's associated with anorexia. If those animals are on full feed and they go off feed for any reason, they'll start having a lot of these animals come down with gastric ulcers. So if you have an infectious disease or anything that, gets, that makes these animals stop eating full feed, you'll have secondary gastric ulcers and death from that. There was a recent paper based on all of the different helicobacter species and spiral bacteria that have been that have been uh, documented associated with mild superficial gastritis and ulceration in people, several other mammalian species. There was a study done looking for these in pigs. They did not find any bacteria that were morphologically similar to Helicobacter, but they did find a tightly coiled uh, bacteria that they cultured. It's Gastrospirillum. They found that the highest number of these organisms were in the, were in the glandular stomach, but of course in animals that had ulcers, the non-glandular stomach wasn't there. <laughs> and they're in the mucus layer, and they weren't necessarily associated with a gastritis. So they just put a big question mark there and said, well, gosh. They did seem to be, there were more of them in pigs with ulcers than those without ulcers. But you know, whether it's cause or effect, nobody knows. It's a question mark right now, but the paper's out there. I think it was recently in Vet Pat. Yeah. No. That's the only paper I've seen. Uh, you can bet, you can bet. I, they've got agricultural money in North Carolina that was, that was contributed by the integrators to study these. So you can bet soon we'll have the paper out. I'm sure they're looking now. Yeah? This, this isn't just a problem of confinement either because I see, I see three of these bleach out a month from pigs that are out on, in the field. So, and I, I don't think we have any idea what it is either, but it's, and, and I have seen ulceration of the fundus and pylorus in pigs too without part of esophageal ulcers. So, and, and I, most of the time there's a little pneumonia or something, and I think anorexia is probably associated with it in, under those conditions too. But it's, I mean, it's not just a disease of intense confinement. No, uh, but it's intensified. I mean, the percentage death loss is higher there. Stan, you know anything more about these? Way back in the 60s, when people were interested in liver transplants in the UK, the easiest way to produce uh, an esophageal ulcer in a pig was to re reduce the water ration for 12 hours. And I suspect that a lot of these cases, and most North Carolina pigs, they actually shed the water in the summer. And the one of the simplest reasons for it may be there is, in fact, a dehydration of the mucus in, in the stomach wall. Ooh, I like that a lot. Uh, there was very much a model for producing a esophageal ulcer that Ransom used to use before they were using a baccarat. was to actually just confine a, a, a any finishing food in just enough space so that it could stand up and lie down, to remove water for 12 hours and not feed it and guarantee an esophageal ulcer within 12 hours. Wow. So have you told them that down at NC State? Have you? Okay. Well, they ought to be publishing on your observations soon then. <laughs> Good. Bob Strong and Steve Henry did a study with, with, with feed drying, and I'd always heard, you know, um, finely ground feed was a problem with it. And the, 
the, the feed that they had to use to grunt to be finally enough ground where they saw an increased incidence of this was face powder. I mean, it w <laughs> you couldn't tell it was feed at all. So even some pretty finely ground feed that they used didn't, didn't even really do a good job of producing it. But their, their feelings more were, were anorexia and probably lack of water too. I mean, that's, that's probably the reason. <coughs> yes, sir. Okay. It's a big problem, and it's getting attention now because it's in, in many areas it's the leading cause of death in grower finisher pigs. Okay, we have ulceration here of the fundus of a pig. This is unusual, um, uncommon. More than likely, the, the primary cause of this is infarction. As we were discussing earlier, the tendency toward toward uh, um, uh, thrombosis of vessels in the gastric mucosa, we're probably looking here at infarction and ischemic necrosis. This is also, if you read textbooks, they describe it being more common where there are stomach worms in pigs. Um, I think I've seen stomach worms once in pigs in the last 15 years, but I probably haven't seen more than 10 of these, so I, I, I can't really comment. Okay, stomach worms in pigs. Hyostrongulus rubidus. Uncommon. The only place you'll generally see them are in pastured animals because of uh, intermediate hosts. Okay, small intestine now. A couple comments about small intestines of pigs for those of you who are not pig people. Okay, in very young pigs, they have very long villi, but very quickly, they no longer have very long villi. The villus to crip ratio in a newborn pig is 10 to 11 to 1. But by the time those pigs are 2 to 3 weeks of age, they're down to 5 to 6 to 1 or lower. In very young pigs, the re one of the reasons, I don't know whether it's one of the reasons, it's just a fact. These, these cells, you'll notice that they're very vacuolated. They have basal nuclei, and the, and the apical portion of the cell is very vacuolated. These cells are older than four days old. They're moving from the crypt to the surface, and the general theory is, is that once they're colonized by normal flora, the cell age decreases, and by the time those animals generally, it depends to some degree on the management and environment, but by the time they're weaned, you will have seen no vacuolated cells at all in the small intestine of a pig, okay, and which means that the average cell age is under four days, because those vacuoles form after four days of age for those cells. Okay, so we're looking at a very rapid progression to much more rapid turnover of cells, shortening of the villi as the pigs get older. So when we're looking at lesions of atrophic enteritis, they're much more remarkable in neonates than they are in weaned pigs. Because a weaned pig, you can't grossly or subgrossly see villi where you can in neonates. Okay, this is what we're looking at. This is a, this is a two or a three day old notobotic pig. That's how long we're looking at villi being in those animals, okay? Normal, in the upper half of the small intestine, pigs suckle generally about every two hours. Because they suckle every two hours, they almost always have milk in their stomachs under a normal situation. And they generally will have chyle in the lacteals of the upper half of the small intestine almost all the time. And the way you ask yourself whether they should have is you look at the stomach contents before you evaluate the significance of not having Kyle. Okay, I want to try and we're going to cover E. coli's here and break them down into some of the newer stuff that uh, has come out in papers on E. coli. First, we're going to talk about ETEC, enterotoxigenic E. coli's. Okay, this is kind of the classic mechanism of pathogenesis. We're going to talk about pigs. Okay, enterotoxigenic E. coli or coli-bacillosis causing diarrhea in pigs is a problem in suckling pigs and in wean pigs, okay, all the way up to about six weeks of age. The strains that cause that can be hemolytic colony types or non-hemolytic colony types. Generally, 
the classic cholebacillosis that's been described in pigs is pigs that are under a week of age, in the first two to three days of age. Most of the time, those are non-hemolytic colony types. Some European papers have described a, an increased number of hemolytic colony types. And, and in research done both in Europe and in the U.S., in weanling pigs, almost all the strains are hemolytic. People really don't know why, but they are. Okay? The lesions in the pathogenesis in, in this is only in the small intestine. These strains colonize by way of fimbria. The older word are pili. Okay, in suckling pigs, there are four pili of significance in pigs. They're listed there. Okay, K88, 987P, K99, and F41. In weaned pigs, until recently, more than half of the weaned, the, the E. coli is isolated from weaned pig diarrhea, they couldn't find a pillus on. The only pillus in weaned pigs that, that is common with suckling pigs is K88. The reason for that, weaned pigs don't have receptors for the others, okay? Receptor presentation changes in the intestine. But there's been a new one that has been, that's been described as 2134P is what it's described as. I've got in parentheses F107. Just write it down. I'll tell you why it's there in a minute. But 2134P has, has explained almost all the other cases. Between those two pili, th those really explain almost all the cases of weaned pig diarrhea. They secrete enterotoxins. There's two general types, uh, uh, heat-liable toxins. And you can, you can read papers and look up in books, and for boards, you need to know how they do it, how they work their woe at a molecular basis. But they basically bind at the receptor. They stimulate aden adenylate cyclase, and they increase cyclic AMP, and they cause hypersecretion. Heat-stable enterotoxins, there's two closely related antigenic types, STA and STB. They stimulate guanylate cyclase. They result in increased intracellular levels of guanosine monophosphate. And in that case, they inhibit resorption. Bottom line is they both cause secretory diarrhea. Okay, so when we see lesions, what we're going to see are intestines that are distended with fluid contents. And the content that we see is generally a very homogeneous fluid content. The reason being now, we don't have maldigestion here. So we're having milk digested both by the pancreatic enzymes and the enzymes, at the uh, amino peptidases at the brush border. So you end up with a very homogeneous watery content in these pigs. And you end up with intact villi. So microscopically, what we see are nice, normal, smooth brush borders uniformly colonized by bacteria. This is a game sustain. Electron microscopically, these bacteria, if you look at the top picture here, the bacteria are not in close apposition to the brush border. The brush border is still intact. The microvilli are there. The pili, this is a higher electron micrograph, are keeping them at a distance, and they're actually colonizing the, the uh, mucus layer. Okay. In some of these animals, uh, and I've seen them mostly in the 10 to 21 day range, the content will be similar, but you'll have a reddish discoloration to it. Most of the times, these tend to be hemolytic colony types. I have no idea whether the hemolysin is causing hemorrhage into that yellow content to give them this color. But typically, in that age range, they will, they'll still be colonized in the same way. But microscopically, instead of having nice, normal villi left, what you'll end up having are loss of the superficial epithelium. And that loss of epithelium, if you catch them acute enough, they'll look just like the ones I showed you before. But these pigs will have fibrum thrombi within the, the vessels in the lamina propria, you'll end up with loss of the uh, epithelium. It's still cholebacillosis. Okay? We're going to throw in edema disease. It's going to be covered under the other systems in terms of most of the lesions, but I want to talk about the pathogenesis because we're talking in edema disease about a disease that affects post-weaning pigs. E-T-E-E-C is used in some texts. They're calling it enterotoxemic implying a toxemia as opposed to an enterotoxin. Enterotoxemic E. coli or edema disease. It's post-weaning. There are almost always hemolytic strains of E. coli, and they have found to be within just three somatic serotypes. What they found is that all of these bacteria share a common fimbria, F107. 
This work was done independently of the groups working on weanling pig diarrheas. Turns out that F107 is almost exactly identical to 2134P, the one I just described to you. And I think that they're going to call them antigenic variants of the same one. And I don't know what they're going to call it yet. They're, they're haggling about what it gets to be called right now. So we got one pillus in post-weaned pigs that's associated with edema disease and post-weaning diarrhea, right? Okay, the receptor is only in the uh, small intestine. Okay, and it's on, well, that's unimportant. Um, these, these, the common underlying pathogenesis of these strains of E. coli is that they secrete a sugar-like toxin variant that induces an angiopathy. That is the cause of edema disease. And some of these strains also secrete heat-liable enterotoxins. That's why sometimes you'll have diarrhea be a component, be associated with edema disease, and other times you won't. Not all of them are enterotoxin producers. There's a delay in experimental models between when they colonize and clinical disease of edema disease. What they've generally found is when they feed the E. coli to these pigs, they colonize, and if they're enterotoxin producers, they get diarrhea, but they aren't going to have edema disease until seven to nine days later. That's why if you get pigs in a diagnostic laboratory that have edema disease and you try and isolate the offending E. coli, it's usually not there anymore. Okay? And we have edema. The most common locations for edema are in the eyelids and the subcutis of the face, the mesocolon and the gastric wall and the brain. Okay. Eyelid. When we get to the GI system, the edema is in the stomach wall. It's between the mucosa and the muscularis. It generally kind of looks like Knox gelatin if you're a cook. And if you're not, it looks just like that. Okay, and sometimes you have to cut the stomach wall in a lot of locations along the greater curvature and all about, and it'll appear like little pea-sized enlargements of edema. You won't have this nice confluent thickening of edema. You've got to go looking for it. This is edema of the mesocolon. Again, rather clear, gelatinous, high-protein edema fluid. Okay, EPAC, enteropathogenic E. coli, or attaching and effacing E. coli. <coughs> the literature is really confusing about these, really confusing. In the human literature, these are called E. hex, enterohemorrhagic E. coli, because the primary offender is the jack-in-the-box E. coli, H7, oh, I've forgotten. Somebody, what is it? Oh, 50, oh, yeah, thank you. At any rate, it's that one. What it, that, that strain of E. coli, the ones that, are, that cause uh, hemorrhagic diarrhea and, and, and uremic syndrome in humans, is an causes an attaching and effacing lesion. It also produces virotoxins. The attaching and effacing E. coli in calves and in rabbits produce virotoxins. Pigs seem to be unique so far in that these, these organisms colonize both the small and large intestine. They cause a classic attaching and effacing lesion uh, microscopically and electron microscopically. Um, they, are, they attach by way of uh, a, an EAE gene product called Entamin. It's a 94 kilodalton protein and is not a fimbria, but they're virotoxin negative. This is what the lesion looks like at a light microscopic level. You're looking at intimate attachment of E. coli, and then in the subjacent cells that those E. coli are attaching to, they cause cell death. So rather than having a nice smooth brush border like the left, and like we were seeing with coli bacillosis, you get a variegated border like this from E. coli attachment. Here you can see just a few cells with these things attaching. Micro or electron microscopically, the lesion is very classic. I'm sure you all know it. It's in uh, both of Cheville's texts. You can look it up, but it's, it's a classic attaching and facing lesion. Okay, Clostridium perfringens A. This is something that's getting more attention. It's not, well, I don't really know how common it is. It's not tremendously common. I think it's something we need to mention. It's classically described as causing a watery diarrhea in pigs one forty days of age with high morbidity and low mortality. Where there have been studies done, they've shown high overgrowth of the organism in the lumen, not attaching, and production of an enterotoxin. 
The kicker is there's no growth or microscopic lesions. We really haven't any tool currently to diagnose this effectively. Because what you're going to end up with is this. You're going to end up with that history I just described. You're going to have no lesion of, of atrophic enteritis, no evidence of bacterial colonization, no evidence for cholebacillosis. And if you flush the lumen well so that you get nice fixation the way you should, you won't even have any sporulated gram-positive organisms to look at. Right? You just have this. And that's all you've got with Clostridium perfringens type A, according to the papers that are published. If, however, you tie off the gut and it has milk-type contents in it and then you fix it by inflation with a syringe and needle, you'll end up with large amount, large numbers of gram-positive rods within the milky contents in the intestine. Okay. <coughs> Uncommon cause of diarrhea in pigs. Go ahead. hugely overgrown contents, but they're not always gram positive. There's a lot of gram negatives in them. Some look like fusobacterium. Is that, do you think that's the same syndrome, or is this something else that we're not recognizing? I don't know. You know, in this country, Jim Collins is the one that's published two papers on this, and there, there are a couple publications out of Europe, and they all kind of end up in this equivocal area uh, with the discussion with about three wishy-washy disclaimers when they're all done, and nobody really knows. You know, your laboratory has, the, has an advantage in that you're still doing passive protection in mice so that if you have a question, you can at least ask yourself whether it's a type A clostridium perfringens yet. To my knowledge, you're the only laboratory in the United States that's currently doing that. We, we put things into mice all the time that, what, you know, you get pretty equivocal results from that too, so I don't know. It's <coughs> what, we, what Doug's seen it and I've seen it, and we both discuss it, and it always comes up to well, I don't know what it means either. It's in the literature, okay? And there's really, uh, the only place you're going to run into it's on the vet path portion of the test because there's no lesions to see grossly or microscopically. So, so it's going to be a discussion of what's in the literature. Um, this is an uncommon lesion in pigs also. It's, it's uh, adenoviral enteritis. Adenovirus in pigs affects enterocytes. So you're going to have these large uh, basophilic intranuclear inclusion bodies within enterocytes. Generally, there is not villus atrophy. If there is, it's very, very mild. The amount of viral infection is not so great that you have villus atrophy in these things. You just find these inclusions in pigs. Now, in, uh, make this distinction. If you see adenoviral enteritis or pneumoenteritis in calves, adenovirus replicates within endothelium of the capillaries and lamina propria. You'll end up with hemorrhage. Okay, so it's different in pigs. Okay, let's talk about atrophic enteritis. Most common causes, TGE virus, which is a coronavirus, and rotavirus. In pigs, in order, rotavirus, antigenic group A, followed by antigenic group C, followed by antigenic group B. They've all three been described in pigs. There are only vaccine, there's only vaccines against antigenic group A and C. There's only one company that has C included in their vaccine, as far as I know. Coccidia. Also, it's a common cause of atrophic enteritis in pigs. <coughs> the last four I included because they're in the literature, and there's more I could have included that are in the literature. But chlamydia has been published on recently, causes atrophic enteritis. There you're looking at small punctate bacteria within vacuoles in the cytoplasm of enterocytes. Those are the elementary bodies that you're looking at, okay? The organisms within the elementary bodies. There's only been one paper on this. Um, we don't have an, a, uh, an FA reagent or immunohistochemistry to diagnose it in our lab. I don't know that I've ever diagnosed it. But if I ever see atrophic enteritis with vacuoles in the cytoplasm with punctate things in them, I'll stain them with a hemones and try, okay? Porcine enteric calici virus has been described periodically as has astrovirus. They both replicate within the cytoplasm of enterocytes and cause atrophic enteritis. There is one paper describing a putative parvovirus replicating in crypt cells of pigs. It was not cultured. It's in the literature. Looks like canine parvo. I don't know if I believe it, but it's there. Okay, so atrophic enteritis. TGE virus we see in all ages of pigs in an epizootic. Rotavirus typically we see in the late suckling stage and weanling pigs. Okay, 
You see, atrophic enteritis, I think, is the most appropriate if you see a, a gut that's distended with, with fluid and thin-walled in appearance. Okay, this shows that in the proximal half of the intestine, if the stomach contains milk, there isn't chyle in the lacteal. This slide really shows a lot of the changes you should see with viral enteritis. Number one, you can see that the intestinal wall is so thin that you can look through both layers of it and see you could read newsprint through this, it's so thin. Okay, atrophic enteritis. And the other feature, notice the consistency of the ingesta. Okay, here we have maldigestion. No longer do we have the brush border enzymes, we have a lack of amino peptidases, and as a result, we end up with, with coagulum, these flocules of undigested milk that are in the contents. That's probably the easiest way to know that you have atrophic enteritis grossly in suckling pigs. Okay, this happens to be an experimental case of rotavirus. It's just to show you, this is rotavirus 12 hours after inoculation in a three-day-old notobiotic pig. I show this to emphasize a few lesions you ought to be looking for in acute viral enteritis. That is, all we're really looking at is cloudy swelling of cells if they're dying from a viral infection. You know what cloudy swelling is in any other organ. That's what these enterocytes are doing. These cells will sometimes shed and fall off like these are. Sometimes they'll explode and, and spew their contents out. You'll have ne necrotic debris and nuclear debris that ends up in the lamina propria. Other times these cells will implode into each other before they shed, and you'll end up with groups of three or four cells with pycnotic nuclei in them. All evidences of acute viral enteritis. You won't see that with calcidia. Okay, you don't see that with other things. This is what it looks like elect scanning electron microscopically at 12 hours after inoculation. You can get an idea here that we have erosion. The thing that I'm always floored with, this is just six hours later. Same pig. That's how phenomenally fast the lamina propria retracts and they can cover up those erosions. And this is just six hours after that. So let's face it, when we're looking at slides diagnostically, we're looking at a very narrow window when we're doing these diagnostics. The other thing that you'll see with viral enteritis is, is bridging of villi. What happens there is if you have exposed lamina propria and it touches the adjacent villi, all of those different cell-mediated adhesins stick to one another. And they don't end up being pushed apart until the enterocytes grow out and actually force them apart as the villi grow. So there, and in, at least in my experience, I don't see nearly as much villus bridging if you're looking at neonates as you do if you're looking at pigs near weaning. There you're looking at much more rapid cell turnover. That's what it looks like on scanning. You can see all these crypt openings and all these, these villi have bridged over one to another here. Coccidiosis. Coccidiosis you will never see, according to the experts, in pigs under five days of age. It's a synchronous life cycle. You want me to stop? Okay, I'll go. I'm going to go about three more minutes, and then we'll stop. Be a stopping point. We'll finish atrophic enteritis. Generally, five to 21 days is where you're going to see evidence of coccidiosis caused by isosporosis. suis. Lesions are in the small intestine, most typically in the distal half of the small intestine, where you're going to see the lesions. The mildest lesion that one will see grossly is this that of a catarrhal enteritis. I think you can appreciate that we have some reddening of the mucosa, maybe a little bit of thickening from edema, but you can see these kind of strands of white mucus on the surface, and here, maybe a coagulum of either fibrin or suppurative exudate right there, catarrhal enteritis. As it gets more severe, fibrin is exuded within the lesion, so we end up here with this kind of yellow, fibrinous enteritis or fibrinonecrotic enteritis, depending on how severe it becomes. This, this fibrin is rather superficial in coccidiosis unless it's secondarily infected. You can take a knife and just scrape that off a nice glistening mucosa. Make that distinction from what you see with, with the differential for this lesion, and that is subacute clostridium perfringens type C. And in that case, it's necrosis, and there's no scraping at all, because it's actually the mucosa you're looking at. Okay. <coughs> this is about as thick as you get, and that's been scraped off to show you that we have a nice glistening mucosa still present underneath. Albeit it's, a, it's atrophic, yes, but it's still usually intact and glistening unless you have secondary bacterial infection. Okay, isosporous suet. This is schizogony, the asexual replicating stage. You can see developing 
merozoites within a schizont, within the cytoplasm of a cell. This is the sexual stage. With isosperseus, you have two, two cycles of asexual replication, which is generally where you see the clinical disease, followed by, by, the, by gametogony or sexual replication. These are both uh, microgametes and macrogametes within this. Generally, where you see this is in the most distal part of the small intestine. Okay, impression smears can be used to diagnose it. Here we have an enterocyte with trophozoites in the cytoplasm. Here we have what was a schizont with nearly fully developed merozoites. The cytos cell, we have a larger degenerate schizont here. And again, on these impression smears, you can see the sexual stages. That's a macrogamete. Okay, we're done with atrophic enteritis. Why don't we, why don't we break? Forty-some minutes. So I'll talk less and show more. Clostridium perfringens type C enterotyxemia causes hemorrhagic diarrhea, <coughs> necrotic enteritis in pigs generally. The acute form that we're looking at now occurs in pigs under a week of age generally. Okay. Classic lesion. This slide's got about all the classic lesions you'll see in it. First of all is acute transmural necrohemorrhagic enteritis that's typically a segmental lesion within the small intestine. You can see also, I think, here that the rather, the, the way the highlights are that there's subserosal lymphosema, another classic part of the lesion because the organism is a gas producer, Clostridium perfringens type C. The other thing that you'll typically see in these, in areas where it's not quite transmural but the mucosa and submucosa is involved, you get this kind of linear longitudinal linear tiger striped appearance of the gut that when it's open there'll be uh, necrotic mucosa that you'll be seeing. This area right here has been opened up. You can see that it's kind of a white necrotic material here, fibrinonecrotic enteritis. Rather similar to what we saw with coccidiosis. When you try and scrape that off though, you just scrape the mucosa off. Okay, a little closer picture of the same thing. I think you can appreciate here the subserosal lymphosema. In some cases where they're vaccinating the sows or there's significant passive antibody protection in the pigs, they won't die in the acute phase, but they'll live a bit longer. And in segments that have been affected more severely, you'll end up with transmural necrosis, as you see here. This is just all necrotic uh, pseudomembrane, actual necrotic mucosa and submucosa extending on through. These pigs will tend to not grow well, obviously. They get very thin and they finally die. Typically, this will happen in pigs that are a week to two weeks of age. Differential here would be coccidiosis that's been secondarily infected with bacteria. By the time they get like this, you're going to be hard pressed to tell which it is. Anyway, diagnostically. Okay, histologically, this is what we're looking at in the acute type lesion. You can see the emphysema, transmural hemorrhage. Here we have a dense. The, the, this is where the villi were, and we just have shells of necrotic lamina propria that are colonized by bacteria. Then we have a, a zonal line of inflammatory cells where uh, at the junction or margin between completely devitalized tissue and where the tissue still remains slightly viable in this mucosa. It's what we're looking at microscopically. In this particular case, this is just with H&E. A lot of these cell or a lot of these bacteria that you can see here actually aren't clostridium. They're a longer, uh, narrower rod. They're saprophytic bacteria. You need a gram stain to also see that there are large gram positive rods within these. Proliferative enteritis. 
Okay, the cause of this has now been demonstrated. The current name that's being used is ileal symbiont intracellularis, previously known as campylobacter-like organism. Okay, this seems to be going to stick. I wish it weren't. There's another proposed name that's, that's Iliobacter intracellularis. I'm not sure which one is officially going to become the name in Burgess. But this organism has now been cultured in a rat enterocyte model. It's an obligate intracellular parasite. It distinguishes itself in that it multiplies within the cytoplasm of cells, free within the cytoplasm, not within bacteria. They have taken this organism, they have fed it to SPF pigs and produced the classic lesion of this disease. They've also fed it to notobotic pigs, but interestingly, when they fed it just to the pig alone, they couldn't reproduce the disease, but when fed with, or they actually they previously fed them Bacteroides vulgaris and E. coli, their controls did not demonstrate any lesions, but when they they fed that to the pigs a few days before they fed this organism, then they could reproduce the disease. So there's a hypothesis that there needs to be something that helps this organism get within the cells to produce the disease. This is the underlying lesion in all of the different forms of this disease that you can see and been described. It's a proliferation of a tall, rather basophilic, undifferentiated crypt cell that will produce dystrophic, branched, irregular crypts that end up causing a thickened mucosa. And within these branched, irregular crypts, they'll tend to exfoliate dead cells, and you'll end up with, with crypt abscesses, if you will, that are filled with dead cells and inflammatory cells. I think you could appreciate just how thickened this mucosa is, too. Hence the term proliferative enteritis or proliferative ileitis. You'll also notice that not only are these cells, they're, they're crowding in here so fully that they're causing a rather pseudostratified appearance here. The cytoplasm, rather than being eosinophilic like it is in normal mature enterocytes, is more basophilic to amphiphilic or slightly eosinophilic, and there's a lack of goblet cells here. Stained with a silver stain, Worth and Starry or Dieterle's, other silver stains, you show these curved rod-shaped bacteria within the cytoplasm, usually of the apical cell, but I think you can see occasional ones down. You'll see them farther down in the cell also, but mostly in the apical cytoplasm of these cells. All right, now, we're going to go through a whole bunch of lesions. This thing can look a lot of different ways. The underlying lesion microscopically is just as I showed you. It can be very diffuse, or it can be rather focally extensive or multifocal. You can find it in pigs where you can't see a gross lesion because it's not developed that far. Rather consistent lesion is enlargement of the mesenteric lymph nodes, or the ileal lymph nodes, when you have this. The location that you see this lesion is in the ileum, or the very distal jejunum and ileum, and in the proximal half to third of the spiral colon. That's where you'll see these lesions. In the original descriptions by uh, Rowland and Lawson in the UK, before they understood the underlying microscopic lesion, they described four separate morphologic lesions or conditions, and those names have kind of stuck in the literature. You see them intermixed with I think the appropriate name is porcine proliferative enteritis. That's the appropriate name. Covers all of these. But you'll also see these other gross morphologics still applied to these different conditions. So I'm going to kind of go condition by condition. Okay, this would be proliferative ileitis, what we're seeing here, or regional ileitis in the original description. Right? What we have, a normal ileum on the top and an uh, affected one on the bottom. You have thickening. That thickening, when you open it up, is due to a thickening in the mucosa. Looks just like an, an, in, or an infiltrative thickening, like you'd see with Yoni's disease also. In this case, it's the proli prolif proliferation of the uh, crypts. Okay. Here, you can also then get a necrotic enteritis, was described. This necrotic enteritis can be in the absence of salmonella, or it can be because of salmonella. I think you always have to sing this lesion have a differential diagnosis of enteric salmonellosis, either salmonella cholera suis or salmonella typhimurium in a pig. Okay, necrotic enteritis. Okay, this was proliferative enteritis. This is necrotic colitis. This is in the proximal portion of the spiral colon. This was not swine dysentery. Okay, it's proliferative enteritis. Ideally, if you see this slide, 
if I saw this on boards, I'd say it was swine dysentery until proven otherwise. But if they also had a hunk of ileum hanging on this thing and opened up and you had the same lesion, then your differentials would include proliferative enteritis or enteric salmonella. Those would be your two differentials, not swine dysentery, because swine dysentery does not affect the small intestine. Okay, this again is proliferative enteritis, but here we have a uh, fibrinous core within the intestine. That's again in the ileum. And then the last, well, the second, another form, the third form, and this is actually, this is a cross section of ileum that we're looking at. This is terminal ileum, okay, cut in half. This is actually smooth muscle hypertrophy here, okay? And in some of these animals, once you get the fibrinonecrotic core, you get occlusion of that. And if it's chronic, if it's chronic, you can get two things happening. You can either have, you can have um, replacement of the submucosa with fibrous connective tissue and or smooth muscle hypertrophy. This animal had classic proliferative lesions in the intestine also. What was the name of this one? I just drew a blank. Yeah, well, it, they called it garden hose gut, but Lawson had another name for it, and all of a sudden I just... Regional ileitis. Thank you, Stan. That's what they used to call it. But this, again, is a manifestation of proliferative, porcine proliferative enteritis when you see it. And then the last form typically occurs in the late grower finisher or with with breeding stock that have been introduced on a farm that's stress-related, and they'll get a bloody diarrhea with it. You, you can have that uh, fibrinous core within the intestine, or you can have just a, a core of fibrin and blood in these. And again, in this case, you can see the proliferation, grossly, of the uh, mucosa. This is porcine proliferative hemor porcine hemorrhagic enteropathy. Proliferative hemorrhagic enteropathy, P-H-E. But again, porcine proliferative enteritis would be appropriate if you're going to hang a morphologic on it. It ought to have proliferation and hemorrhage in it, and you'll be okay. Okay, let's move on. Swine dysentery, limited to the colon. Generally a disease of grower finisher animals and young adult animals. Causes dysentery, mucus and blood within the colon, mucus and blood in the stool, and because it's in the colon, you'll tend to have small volume, large frequency stools. So you'll have small spots of this stuff all over the pens. You'll see animals straining because it's their colon. Caused by Stirpulina hyodysenteria, a strongly beta hemolytic spirochete, okay? Can cause a femoridone hemorrhagic colitis as this. Here we have hemorrhagic, fibrinonecrotic, colitis. It'll affect both the colon and cecum. Serpulina, as a genus, is given that name because they tend to be serpent-like or serpentine long spirochetal organisms like this. There are other spirochetes in the colon of pigs that are not serpulina. They tend to be shorter, they are much thicker, and they're corkscrew-like. They look just like you're ready to use them to open a wine bottle. Okay, these are more serpent-like and they tend to fold back on themselves. Okay, we're ready for another carousel. What role does stress play when you mentioned about introducing breeding stock? Do you oftentimes see hemorrhagic valve right at that time? Yes. And I most of the times I've seen it, it's when breeding stock have been purchased and introduced on a farm. You know, and everything I've read in the literature, there's still some theory that, that it's, a, it's an allergic reaction or an immune reaction that causes the lesion, but I don't think anybody really knows why those animals have this kind of acute hemorrhagic episode. Microscopically, when you look at those things, it's hard to determine where all the blood's coming from. It's, it's capillary diapodesis, you know, where it's moving through the whole mucosa. Um, I guess as you sit there and scratch your head, one would theorize that it's, that it's some sort of allergic manifestation given the fact that you don't have it in, in all the other animals, the younger animals, uh, that you have it. But I don't know that anybody knows why it develops. 
you can have it like some of those slides I showed where you have a fairly significant proliferative lesion in the, in the intestine that you can see grossly, and others, you're hard pressed grossly to see any thickening at all microscopically, you'll have rather mild lesions. You know, there'll be multifocal nests of those cells. Does anybody else know anything about pathogenesis of proliferative hemorrhagic enteropathy? Dr. Thacker? But you're talking about porcine proliferative enteritis in general, not just proliferative hemorrhagic enteropathy, right? What causes bleeding and I don't know. But in my experience, the most common, and, and in talking with practitioners in the U.S., the most common place to see the hemorrhagic form of this is in six to seven month old animals when they've been moved onto a new farm. They've been brought onto a new farm as breeding stock, and then they'll break with this. And you know the issue always is, well, is it, is, it because, is it because they were totally susceptible and clean and they were introduced to it, exposed to it on the farm that they arrived on, or were they carrying and it was stress induced? I don't know the answer. You know, I think in the next five years we're going to get those answers because now there is a probe for the organism that can be used on feces. Epidemiologic studies are being instituted in a couple, three different universities right now. We're going to start finding out a how common this organism is. Most of us probably feel it's very common. We're going to find out how common it is based on the sensitivity of that probe. I think we're going to finally be able to start doing pathogenesis studies because we can finally reproduce the disease using we very loosely. One yeah. other thing to suggest what you're suggesting is right, Greg, is that a number of years ago there was a study to look at preventing this where they gave antibiotics and prophylaxis and it was quite effective Okay, we're back to swine dysentery. Okay. The original studies, when they tried to feed Serpuline Ohio dysentery to germ-free animals, they had a whale of a problem reproducing that disease also. And they needed to give them various normal flora uh, with Serpuline Ohio dysentery before they could reproduce the disease, which led to some trepidation and argument among people as to whether it was really the cause. I think it's general acceptance that there is these spirochetes proliferate. The lesion that you see here is first, we have mucosal thickening. We have goblet cell hyperplasia. I think the, the classic lesion with dysentery that one, wants to, that one wants to see is that you have the lesion tends to remain for in the most, the most severe portion of the lesion is superficial, where you'll have superficial mucosal necrosis in the uh, colon. You'll have goblet cell hyperplasia and a catarrhal enteritis first or colitis first with mucus pouring to the surface and then you'll have variable amounts of superficial necrosis. You have hemorrhage pouring to the surface, fibrin on the surface, often balantidium coli in this. When you do silver stains and you want to go looking for the organisms, you want to go looking in this area where you see abundant uh, mucin pouring out of these glands and distended glands with mucin in them are going to be your areas where you can find the organisms most easily. Okay, here we have even more dilation of the colonic glands with mucin and superficial necrosis. Okay, this is on the surface, close up with the surface, and you can see all of these pycnotic and degenerate cells within this necrotic pseudomembrane that's on the surface. And you can see right in here is where you're going to want to go look. Oftentimes, right at the surface, there'll be so much uh, other bacterial overgrowth, secondary bacterial overgrowth, you want to get a little bit deeper. You see this sort of thing. This is in the superficial portion. Here's Valentidium coli. And here we can see these serpentine spirochetes within that mucus I was talking about. A little bit deeper, where I was showing you in those distended areas of the crypts deeper. These are just tangled, fairly pure mats of those spirochetes. We run into a question in diagnostic labs from a legal standpoint. What does it take? What does it take to constitute a diagnosis of swine dysentery? Microbiologists would tell you you can't do it without isolating the organism and demonstrating that it's strongly beta-hemolytic. I think you're on very, very thin ice trying to make a morphologic diagnosis of swine dysentery without the criteria needed to diagnose dysentery in general, superficial necrosis and blood. Now, I'm talking now in the absence of isolation. But if you have superficial necrosis and blood and serpentine spirochetes, 
you've got a very strong case for the morphologic diagnosis of swine dysentery. Now, the demonstration with mucus and serpentine spirochetes alone is not enough, and this is why. We have another condition that's given, it's, it's kind of a nebulous area right now. I think probably the best name for it's colonic spirochetosis. In diseases of swine, Taylor wrote the chapter from the UK, he called it intestinal spirochetosis, but it isn't in the small intestine, it's in the colon, so I think that may be a little better either way. And some people call it nonspecific colitis, which would kind of include this and some other undescribed things. So I'm going to kind of tell you what's in that. What they're describing is a condition in grower finisher pigs where the pigs tend to have a diarrhea of moderate morbidity, low mortality. The diarrhea will have mucus in it, and it will be anywhere from, from a loose stool to a very watery stool, always with mucus in it. When you post the animals, when you do necropsy in the animals, typically what you see is a, is a slightly enlarged colon that may have a bit of colonic edema. When you, when you look at the contents, there'll be mucus in the contents. When you try and wash the contents off the mucosa, there'll be little particles of feed that adheres to the mucosa. And you ask yourself, gosh, is that normal or is there something wrong? Well, there is something wrong. They're just little erosions that you have a hard time seeing grossly. And they're stuck because there's fibrin there. It's a very mild erosive fibrinous colitis. And there have been several organisms associated with this. The first one that was associated with it a few years ago is Serpulina innocens. Weakly beta, weakly beta hemolytic, spirochete like Serpulina pyodysenteria. And the lesion you'll see microscopically is a mild erosive colitis. And you'll see those organisms within the mucus, within the colonic glands, just like I described. There's been a more recent organism described with this condition. And it's been called different things in the literature. The Australians have been calling it, an <laughs> at first, Anguilina or Anguilina coli. Okay? I've seen it. There's a group, uh, Gerald Duhamel at Lincoln, Nebraska, is working on this. He said that they've submitted to Burgess in a paper requesting that it be called they and the working together with the group in uh, Taylor's group in UK are proposing the name Serpulina pylosi coli. And they're, they're proposing that because of some features of this condition. Number one, they've done genetic work on, I believe it's the small subunit ribosomal RNA, and they've shown that this is indeed a serpulina. Okay, so, so they know it's a serpulina based on sequence. Pylosi coli, I can't even remember what all it stands for, but... Pylo, that's right. Thank you. But the, these things colonize the surface, only the mature colonic epithelial cells. They tend to palisade or line up like picket fences and form what they're calling a pseudo brush border, or false brush border along the superficial part of the colon. You can see them, they're so dense, you can see them on H&E. You stain them with silver stain and they form a nice dark layer there. Okay, that's not typical of Serpulina innocens. When you see that, it's probably this organism. One really. I think most of his isolates have come, he's from Quebec, veterinary school in, in Canada, and I think most <coughs> of the stuff that he's got down has come from up there, and they've sent him slides. I don't think we ever even have seen it. I have. I have. And I got, I got going out on farms where, in, in these cases that I've seen it, they were feeding pelleted, pelleted feed in finishers, and uh, in, I'd, I'd cut in a lot of colon, and I did find some of these also. And I, I know he's also gotten isolates from the Tulare lab in California. I know he's gotten some from there too. This, don't get me wrong, this isn't a, a common, common lesion. The problem is, as we're dealing with intensive swine rearing, and as we're looking at probably one of the greatest factors out there now in all in, all out swine rearing, is that we want closeouts on rooms of pigs where the animals are all close enough together weight wise that they get maximum payback at slaughter. And the problem with these animals is you start having too many tail enders and you don't get good closeouts on your rooms and they're very costly. So, you know, this may have been around and we never recognized it, but we're going to see more of this in the literature. All right? These are, these are take pictures taken out of a book. 
Okay, so they're not gr the greatest, but this is what it looks like. Just a, a shiny content in the colon, slightly enlarged colon. The colons from the outside are going to have a little bit of edema, and they're going to have these, these subserosal abscessed lymphoglandular complexes. This gross lesion at one time would have been called colitis cystica profunda, but really what those, some people will look at these and call these ostratagia nodules. They're not in a pig. They're the lymphoglandular complexes, the kind of tonsil-like uh, invaginations of the colonic crit or colonic glands that go into the submucosa become abscessed and they prolapse through the uh, muscularis to the subserosal location. Okay, and when you open these things up, on the surface you have these pieces of feed that will be stuck after you wash them off to a rather glistening mucosa that may be a little hyperemic. That's a better one. That's when they've been really washed. They're the kind that don't look real bad, but they just aren't quite right. Mild, fibrinocatarrhal, and erosive colitis. Okay, enteric salmonellosis, fibrinonecrotic enterocolitis. That's about all you need to say about it. Salmonella typhimurium or Salmonella cholera suis. Affects the small intestine and the large intestine and the cecum. As I said before, typhimurium, we don't isolate typhimurium much at all anymore. Um, when I was at Iowa State in the 70s, we isolated it not uncommonly. Anybody else from diagnostic labs, are you isolating much typhimurium from pigs? No in Georgia? Stan, how about in the UK? No? Not much of it around in pigs, thank goodness. You know, you can go and eat a cupcake before without washing your hands and not kill yourself, huh? But um, in the literature, this is... Salmonella cholera suis, a picture of colon, and this is showing a very acute lesion, multifocal hemor hemorrhages that are, that are uh, rather nodular. Those are infarcts that later look like this. Now they're becoming, you can see actual round hemorrhages with necrosis that will later become those button ulcers we were talking about. If you see a colon like this in a pig, now this you can't really tell it's colon. You'd be hard pressed on boards. But if you could tell it was colon and you see that pattern, Call it Salmonella cholera suis, okay? It's the best, best thing you can do with it because you're actually looking at infarct. And this is the same slide you saw earlier with these deep button ulcers. Salmonella cholera suis or Salmonella typhus suis? Okay, this again is salmonellosis. Differentials for this lesion now, if you see colon and you see a very severe fibrinonecrotic colitis, Salmonella, swine dysentery, Porcine proliferative enteritis, probably in those in that order. Mm. And then the classic description with uh, Salmonella typhimurium in the literature are these pigs that ended up with megacolon. The megacolon supposedly is secondary to rectal stricture, that supposedly is secondary to vascular compromise in this area, leading to this. Most of the cases of megacolon I've seen are in groups of pigs that were cold not too long before and they piled on each other and had rectal prolapses and then they chewed them off of each other. And you end up with rectal strictures, this sort of thing. And you end up with rectal strictures because of fibrosis from rectal prolapses in pigs. You know, so I think we still see, we don't see the number of rectal strictures that were reported at one time when sal Salmonella typhimurium is around, but we still see some rectal strictures. There are other people that believe those rectal strictures are a, are a genetic, they're, they're her inherited. I don't know. I think all of those things can apply. Okay. Colon, another differential for catarrhal colitis or even fibrinocatarrhal colitis or necrocatarrhal colitis are whipworms, trichura suis. Okay, they, they'll be in the cecum and in the colon. Okay, now just some, some different lesions. Here we have an inguinal hernia with an incarcerated piece of intestine, an ischemic small intestine. Here, here we have a, uh, a volvulus, a mesenteric root with infarction of the small intestine. Bring up this. I, I find I'm on the enteric diseases of swine subcommittee and the AAVLD, and we kind of had this free-ranging discussion of people from all different diagnostic labs. 
And in diagnostic labs, there seems to be kind of agreement that there's a condition called hemorrhagic bowel syndrome in pigs. But it's not in the literature, and among academicians, there certainly isn't any agreement that exists. But I do want to mention, there's a condition that does happen in pigs. I don't know what causes it, but it's there. It's a cause of death, usually in grower and finisher pigs. These pigs typically are in very high feed consumption, oral feed consumption as a percentage of body weight. They'll be seemingly very healthy, and then they'll find them dead within a few hours with distended abdomens. And when the, they're necropsied, the small intestines will be uniformly dilated with gas and very watery, bloody fluid. That's it. And it's kind of, it's, it's called hemorrhagic bowel syndrome. It is not in diseases of swine. It didn't make the academic honor roll to get in the book. But it is, and it does seem to be distinct from porcine proliferative enteritis. It does seem to be responsive to antibiotic therapy as a preventative. Thailand is the most commonly used. Um, as everybody sits around tables in bars at meetings and talks about it, you know, people wonder about acute endotoxemia or acute clostridial enterotoxemia as causes. Those are the two leading hypotheses. I do believe it's something distinct from porcine proliferative enteritis. Um, but when you open pigs up, the differential is always a volvulus, you know, for those pigs. So one needs to look. Okay. This is a uh, volvulus and or torsion of the colon. Yes, the point being here for those going to sit boards, one, sh you should be able to tell that's what it is by the enlargement and engorgement, by the fact that the, this looks like transmural devitalization. It's not shiny and glistening. It seems to be devitalized. You should get the idea you're looking at ischemic necrosis there. Now this, on the other hand, is it is from a uh, this ulceration of the pars esophagia, gastric ulcer. This is what I was talking about earlier, where you have the digested blood in the colon, and if you wash that off, the colonic mucosa look perfectly normal. This is a small intestine with the same digested material in it, and if the pig's been dead any time at all, you'll have in, in, imbibition of, of hemoglobin and get discoloration, but microscopically you'll have a normal intestine. This is vitamin D intoxication. Take a look at this. You really ought to be able to get these things, even if you get hit with them cold, because you get that kind of chalky appearance when you're looking at that. Man, if you see a chalky appearance, you ought to be thinking about mineralization every time. We're looking at subserosal mineralization of the small intestine here with a feed mixing error and vitamin D intoxication. The only histologic picture I have is another location that mineralization is common in these animals, and that's in the gastric mucosa. Here we're looking at mineralization, and this mineralization tends to be uh, within the glandular portion of the stomach, right in the mid portion of the glandular portion of the stomach. That's just another area of mineralization here. This is a uh, mesenteric lymph node. When I sat boards, slide just exactly like this was on the boards. There was nothing more to it than just that. And you get that sickening feeling when half of the people immediately start to write and half of them stare at it. And you know that you either know it or you don't. Okay? Mesenteric lymph node from a pig. These are mineralized granulomas. This is tuberculosis caused by Mycobacterium avian intracellular complex or intracellular complex. Most common cause in pigs are caused by serotypes 1 and 2, which are from domesticated poultry origin. The other time that you'll see this it's when pigs are being raised on wood shavings or some wood product that's come from the forest, and supposedly it's from contamination from, from bird feces within those wood shavings, and those tend to be serotypes 3 and 4. Something else we were talking about within some integrated herds, uh, they had a, a large condemnation problem at slaughter where they were having mineralized granulomas and retropharyngeal lymph nodes. They were being diagnosed by the inspectors as TB, but they, and they were isolating Rhodococcus equi from these lymph nodes. Rhodococcus equi will stain with, a, with a, uh, some acid fast stains. So just because you have this lesion and, and you do acid fast stains, you have granulomas that are mineralized and you find some acid fast bacteria, doesn't automatically mean that you have tuberculosis in pigs. Now in pigs, 
Mycobacterium bovis has been described, but almost all cases of tuberculosis in pigs are enteric. Almost all of them are limited to the retropharyngeal and, and, and gastrointestinal lymph nodes, and occasionally you'll have granulomas form in the periportal areas of liver in those animals. Okay, enteric ascariasis, ascarasua. Say it loud. Uh, Macrocatharynchus, what? Hyrudinaceus. Now you've seen one in your lifetime. Uh, do, you, do you ever see these things in the southeast? Not anymore? Okay, so this is like from a historic collection just to make you say that that's kind of like the, the coccidia of goats. You know, the... I'm a little curious to back up your goes to the slaughter plants and find them. Keith used to go try and get, try and get uh, ascaris at the slaughter plants and he would find a reasonable number of those, I mean, over a day's <coughs> killing time. But, so they exist, but they're not like, like ascariasis. If, if you said how common is, is enteric ascariasis in pigs, to me, I'd say I never see it. In the diagnostic lab, I think in the last eight years, I've probably seen five, you know, but I mean, there's still evidence with, with migration larvae and stuff. So those of you going to sit boards, if you, if you were asked to give an etiologic diagnosis for this slide, what would it be? Enteric acanthocephaliasis. Yep. Acanthocephalodiasis, I believe. You've got to get a D in there, but you'd get close enough. Okay, that's what it would be. Okay, and that's where the thorny-headed worm embeds in the, in the wall, and you'll have a, you'll have a uh, fibrous nodule and a granuloma surrounding the head where it's embedded. And I'm done. One comment that I had during the last break asked if I ever saw liver lobe torsions in sows. We hardly ever get sows in our diagnostic lab anymore. So I have to say no. I have seen one in a grower finisher pig that came in, but it is an incidental finding that will occasionally incur, occur. And it's usually, what is it, the right? If they're laying on their back, yeah, it's the right liver lobe that torses on the, on those sows. Okay. They, yeah. Okay. Anybody else, something I haven't covered that you've seen in your experience that's worth mentioning? Stan. Right. That's how this acts. Once it starts, once it starts, I mean, it's, it is sporadic, but it's, it's sporadic to, it, to the degree that it becomes very financially significant because you can end up in one closeout with 10% death loss, you know, two or three pigs a day at a time. That's an interesting point. I, milk products generally aren't fed, you know, past nursery rations in this country, though. But, you know, that doesn't mean that it isn't some feed ingredient that there's a hypersensitivity to. What are your feelings about hypersensitivity and pruritus in, in swine? I mean, uh, we, see, we see guts that come through eosinophils one end to the other, a lot of eosinophils, no apparent reason. Other, and, and the history is poor doing, uh, mild diarrhea, Yeah, and whether those, he was talking about pigs that have mild diarrhea and aren't doing right and microscopically have a tremendous number of eosinophils and the lamina propria predominantly of the intestine. Um, you know, the dilemma always there is, is whether it's a hypersensitivity enteritis or whether you're dealing with, with larval migration. You know, I mean, I don't know. There, I was talking with some people from swine graphics here in the U.S. that have been feeding 
you know, they have the largest computerized database here in the U.S. Of, of both, well, of all stages of swine production. And their database is large enough now that if they have a question, they can very quickly search the question out on their database. They're doing a lot of phase feeding. They're split sex feeding and they're phase feeding, meaning that they're, that they're changing the diet based on weight gain. And they're changing the diet oftentimes. Um, it's primarily protein changes, but sometimes it's protein and protein source changes within those diets. They're changing them oftentimes every six weeks throughout the growth phase of these animals. They said that they were having quite a problem. They had to, it's really not a problem, but that these animals, four days after dietary change, would develop a severe diarrhea within almost the whole group. No mortality, high morbidity. You could expect that diarrhea to last about a week and then curtail. But you know that ends up being a sixth of the time if you're phase feeding. But, but. The growth rate is excellent on these pigs. So they, they train the people. Now, where it becomes a real difficult issue is if the facilities that they're finishing the pigs in can't handle the wet, the, the diarrhea. If the facilities are not well constructed, if they're not totally slatted, then you end up with wet hogs that are chilled with pneumonia. Okay? But in that situation, you know, and they're making a strong case, their, their hypothesis is that they're dealing with hypersensitivity reactions to ration changes. Stan, you had a comment. Oh, you didn't? Yeah, there's, there's two more of them that are feeding them the livers of these, of these animals of pasture larval migration or anything. I mean, it's just the livers are beautiful, the eosinophils in the gut. And that's about all. Well, you know, in several years, many years ago now in the Journal of Animal Science, there were a series of studies done by animal scientists where they, they showed, you know, it was post wean pigs. And they were, at that time, 28-day weaning. And they showed, versus their control animals that were not weaned, that were left on milk, they showed significant villus atrophy in those pigs within the first four days post-weaning that, that they said was related to, to weaning and diet change. You know, so that, that's shown. But in those, I don't believe that they had consistent inflammatory cell infiltrates in those pigs. It was more of a, of a classic gluten lesion, you know, where you end up with, with shorter villi and deeper crypts with more immature cells covering those and kind of a sense of more lymphocytes and plasma cells within the lamina propria, but not necessarily eosinophils. Anybody else have any comments, any enteric diseases I didn't mention?